Well, how in the world are you? First of all, it's great to see your face. It's great to see you. It's great to see the background once again. Uh, we talked back in February or so. And uh, how in the world are you? I'm proud to be second air today, brother Nate. <laughs> yeah. Good to, good to be back with you. And you said with a little bit of snowflakes there, or what's uh, how is it? How's the weather up there? Yeah, man, we we have had uh, we had a nor'wester last night at you know forty five mile an hour winds. The snow doesn't accumulate too much because it's go it's going at forty five miles an hour. It's past you know it's it hits out in the woods, and and so that's a blessing. Uh, but the to fight 45 miles an hour winds, man, you're talking wind chill down there. You know, it takes uh, 30 degrees down to 20 degrees <laughs> with that kind of wind chill and, and lower. And, and, it's, and depending on the humidity. And right now, the Great Lakes are still wide open. So we've got lots mm. of humidity. Yeah. Okay, and you're up in Michigan, correct? Yeah, man, tip of the mint. All yeah. right, tip of the mint, right up north, man. It's becoming winter season. It's getting colder. And yeah. um, so first thing is, uh, is uh, since we last talked, we talked back in February or so. It's great to be back, by the way. Great Thanks. to see you. The, the background's still there. You got the instruments going. <laughs> um, what I've noticed, first of all, is I noticed you got back on the road. You, you did yeah. a couple shows over the summer. Can you tell us about that? What it's like being back or uh, what's the schedule been like? Yeah. How, how I, is Mark Forner? Well, I, I'm doing all right. And I, and thank God for the two acoustic shows in Lapeer, Michigan at the Picks Theater. Dave Knapp had us come down there and uh, we had a good time. We had a couple of sellout shows and a lot of people from my hometown, Flint, Michigan, showed up. And, uh, you know, three piece acoustic, it's, it's not a, you know, full blown electric guitars, mm -hmm. loud rock and roll show. It's this, it's this presentation, more of a comfortable volume for people, uh, to, to sit in a small theater. I think it holds, uh, 250 or 300 people, but, uh, but nice intimate audience and, uh, a great place. Uh, Lapeer is a good city. It's got good people. You know, that's what it is. Wherever you go, it might be beautiful uh, looking, you know, to observe aesthetically might be pleasing to the eye, but if the people ain't cool, <laughs> and, <laughs> you know, it's not going to be a good memory. But uh, thank yeah. God I've, I've had uh, some great, you know, rapport with the people uh, in the state of Michigan. Of course, it's my home state and I've been around this state. And my uh, aunt and uncle used to, to live in, in Lapeer. My uh, uncle Carter Scrambling was the under sheriff of Lapeer out there for, for a, year, a number of years. Mm -hmm. So uh, I'm familiar with it. And um, it's great because the people seem to be more uh, receptive or more uh, appreciative of the live music. It's not like they, they never were appreciative, but they're certainly more enthusiastic about it after being cooped up for so damn long. <laughs> well, we've never had a time or a period where you couldn't go to a live show for a year or more, right? It's never, you yeah. Know, so maybe you had to wait for your artist to come back to town for a year, but at least you could go to other shows in the meantime, right? Yeah, dude, that's what I'm talking about. Yeah, so so building an intimate like experience that's totally real when it comes to acoustic shows and thinking of like a trio, like even Crosby, Stills, Nash back in the day too, like those acoustic and the different bands that would do that with their their melody sounds. It's like more intimate compared to you know uh, the shows that you're ever known for the the rock and shred and guitars, which we're gonna get into. By the way, I've checked out some of your live shows from Chile. It's blown me away that you're still absolutely shredding it now. <laughs> and uh, it's no joke. Just like, but, you know, nothing's changed, it seems like, from when you were younger and all the songs that I know that I grew up on. But uh, having an intimate experience, I know it's a foreigner's American band. And so what, what made you want to switch to acoustic and kind of kick back? I know different, different artists have done that over time, like Daryl Hall, for example. 
he's got uh, his born and he, he does more acoustic stuff from Hall and Oates now. Um, what kind of made you uh, want to do more intimate, uh, closer shows with people? Well, I was talking with my buddy, John Anderson, who uh, lives in Tennessee. And um, I go turkey hunting with him. I go deer hunting with him down there. And uh, he was telling me about how he was getting into these acoustic performances. And uh, he was really enjoying it. And I said, uh, you know, look me in the eye, John. <laughs> Tell me, are you really into it? He says, dude, you ain't going to believe it. He says, you need to try this, Farner. So on his uh, recommendation and his, his honest urging me to do it, he says, uh, you'll never regret it. He says, because where do a lot of the guitar, you know, the guitar songs that you come up with, where do they start? Do they start on electric? No, he said, they start right here. And we wrote a song called Shorty's Long Gone. We were deer hunting <laughs> and we were on his property. He's got like 800 acres down there. And uh, we wrote this. So I just started, you know, doing a riff. And uh, uh, I think Shorty's Long Gone will be, you know, John put a version of it on one of his albums. And I'm going to put my version on one of my maybe the next one, maybe the next uh, release of songs. I don't, I don't even call them albums anymore. It's like a bundle of songs. <laughs> okay. Okay. This is news. I love it. All right. Yeah, man. And, and the, you know, I tuned to 432, A432. I don't tune to 440. So 432 on an acoustic guitar, it is in tune with nature. 432 megahertz is uh it just blends so much nicer and it's only eight you know steps down from 440 so it's only just a shade down but enough to make that guitar come alive that acoustic guitar mm. when you tune it to 432 it's just i don't know it it I feel it vibrating against my chest when I'm playing it. You know, I'm going, wow, this sucker's got some low mm. end. You know, it's just, and it's, we are vibrating at 432. So to play in 432, uh, I think, you know, it transmits. I did, uh, you know, several of these like uh, the Hippie Fest uh, tours and Walk Down Abbey Road and happy together. And when I did happy together, um, I asked the guys, I said, would you guys mind tuning to four, three, two? And they go, well, why? And so I showed them a clip, you know, uh, on my laptop. And I said, this is, you know, this is it. And they went, <laughs> they went, well, it's a natural thing. Well, let's try it. And so we played the entire tour in four, three, two. And to me, it was noticeably different. The audience was, they just loved it. And the, and to sing, hey, it's a little bit, it's like just a, just a shade down. So it's not hitting, uh, it's like, uh, it, it's just, just mm. enough for, for you to notice, oh, this is good, man. This feels good to my vocal cords. It's not like, you know, 440 is a bad deal because i played uh, all the grand funk stuff in 440 but 432 man if uh if there's any guitar uh guys out there enthusiasts uh tune your axe to 432 just one time do yourself a favor and if you've got an mm -hmm. acoustic axe that axe will speak to you and go thank you brother <laughs> thank you <laughs> <laughs> right it's like it wants to sing you know so, yeah, so there's a tip. There's a tip from the legendary Mark Farner. First of all, I just want to welcome you back to, to be back with you. It's great to share the word from for Mav Radio. It's been a blessing to be able to talk to you and as part of Mav Radio to share in the Omaha area for not just college students, but even fans that grew up with your music. You've been a part. You're accountable for more than 14 top 40s, five top 10s back in the day, two top ones, 10 platinum records, 10 gold records, more than 
30 million records sold. Is that correct? Are you that, accountable for that? Oh, yes. Yes, that, <laughs> is, uh, <laughs> that is correct. And, and I mean, that 30 million records sold, that doesn't take into consideration any of the downloads or, you know, they, that's, uh, that was, that's been 30 million for what? 30 years. <laughs> right, right. So there's probably more like 50 million or I don't know. It's, uh, it's, you can't calculate it because, uh, you know, all the download stuff. Yeah. And I, I, uh, I was struggling with, you know, not having something physical. Like I always like to have back in the day, the 33 and a third LP, dude, you had this much artwork you could read the words you didn't have to put your glasses on you know you could read and it hits and you open it up like a double album it's like wow man this mm -hmm. is cool and now what do you got <laughs> you'll download it and you click on a number and there's a song it's it's different it's so different. it's on a screen it's 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 digitalized it's totally different i i it makes me think about you know um, anytime I see a record, I see an experience. I see a prized possession. I see something special that I can hold on to, hang up on a wall. It's something special. And again, the work that it takes to, to flip it and create the experience. You have the artwork on it, the writing on it. And now I'll, I'll look at my cell phone sometimes and sometimes it'll be on and it'll be sitting on my nightstand. I look at it and I'm like, there's an entire world that's going on on that thing just on here that I'm just like sitting next to. It's this entire crazy world. And one little snippet of that can be a song. And, and all it takes is to pull it up. There's millions and millions of them just at our fingertips and your entire catalogs out there. Um, what is it? So where are you getting at with this? Is it um, we've I know we've we've discussed like it's kind of we've lost something or or what's your what's your take on the fact that, uh, you know, it's just a little snippet and you got to dig for the gold mine now. Well, I think. Initially, when the music videos came out, you know, everybody had to make a music video or oh, let's make a music video. Let's do this, you know. But when that when the video is created it's it is the author or whoever the director is of the video and the producer it is their depiction of the interpretation of this music right before videos brother nate it was your imagination and that ran a movie in your head when when that got eliminated from the process we were dumbed down that wasn't to be given a you know a video of a song is not a step uh in progress that is a that is a huge step in regress because it takes your imagination out of the equation that's interesting when, when I was in New York City talking to a, a DJ there and they, they told me they asked 100 people to write down their interpretation of what Simon and Garfunkel's Bridge Over Troubled Water. What does that song mean? He said, Farner, we got 100 diversely different explanations not any two were even close. <laughs> you see, there's, there's that within us. It's like when somebody reads a book and then they go to see the movie, they go, man, that movie sucked. You know why? Because it wasn't close to their imagination. What, when you read in that book, your imagination is on fire and it's your feet, wow. that part of you, you're actually growing. You're, you are, uh, you're nurturing your imagination and creativity comes from this expansion of the imagination. But our creativity, because of these music videos, has been stifled. That is my humble opinion. <laughs> yeah, so if I'm hearing you right, because I'm picking, this is very interesting here, thinking of when you have sounds like a song, 
Um, let's let's say that a song is released. There may be the ideal uh, time and place and experience that you could have listening to a song based on every single individual. Maybe I'm listening to a Western song and I think it's the best to listen to in the desert. Right. And, but it's open for my own personal interpretation and, and experience and everything. Right. And it could yeah. be that for everyone else. Are you saying when music videos come about, it almost writes the narrative story for what the song's supposed to be. So it's, it gives you what it's supposed to be like. And it kind of sets the setting to that standard and yeah. limits the, uh, the imagination. Is that kind of what you're explaining here? Exactly, brother. That is mm. exactly what I'm saying. And we need to have our imaginations in gear. <laughs> we need to, we could be farther along technically uh, technologically, as far as what powers our homes, what heats our homes, you know, how we deal with life here on the planet, how to eliminate the greenhouse gases and, and, and such. But uh, the way things are manipulated in, in our current life is by those who control the crude and I don't know if you keep up with the price of the barrel of oil or not, but it has been through the freaking roof and no stopping. And the, the uh, families that own the Federal Reserve, they got this inflation creation machine that just, man, it's like, how much money do you have to take down there to buy a gallon of gas? Now, I mean, people in California playing, paying $7 for, for a regular seven dollars i think that's true too it, it can tip to that point over yeah. yonder you know <laughs> yeah so it's whoo yeah so we need to have our imaginations uh cooking so mm -hmm. that we can deal with the future we don't need to be dumbed down and play into this bs i i i see it as it's not a i'm not a conspiracy theorist uh I'm a conspiracy recognizer, <laughs> you know, okay. I, I recognize when, uh, when stuff is wrong and, uh, I've been able to see things, uh, far in advance for some reason. It's a, it, it's not a gift. It's a, it's a talent uh, from God almighty, from the one who created you and me. And it's, and we're created out of love brother. And so my, my creative bone has always been hooked to the fact um, that I am made from love. And when I pass from this bone suit, I'm going back to love right where I came from. I've had the experience already. I already know because when I had my pacemaker put in, dude, I checked out of the bone suit. I went into heaven for a while. But we as a people... Uh, we need to get smarter, not retarder. <laughs> well, right. I'm a songwriter, Nate. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. I love <laughs> Yeah. Uh, but to, to come up with what we're going to all uh, benefit, for, benefit from in the future, it's not um, this attempt to eliminate humanity by, uh, you know, a uh, pandemic and, uh, and I'm not, I'm not uh, you know, naming names. I'm just, there's powers and principalities that rule the darkness of our world, the Bible. Right. Uh, yeah. but, but they are in bone suits. <laughs> right. Not, you know, it's not just a, this spirit or this ghost walking around and doing all this stuff. It's men and women who are beyond conscience. They, they live in a different consciousness. And uh, for you and I, that we have to earn our money and we have to have money, right? If you're gonna contribute to our society, if you're gonna be part of it, if you're gonna go down and buy that gallon of gas, you're gonna have to have some money. Right. So we do whatever we do to earn our money so that we have food on the table so that we have gas in the tank or whatever. But what if you were part of the bunch that owned the machine that prints money out of thin air? 
nothing to back it up. Just, oh, let's, let's put a few trillion in a stimulus. Are you kidding me? Are you kidding me? Oh, this will hold them off. This will put them at bay. This will make some of them not want to go back to work again. And we can accomplish our evil deeds. There's some sick, right. sick yeah. people out there. I can't imagine. I can't imagine being on that that uh, road. I'm just a guy that's talking about music and thinking about it and trying to enjoy the enjoy the ride and have an adventure. I think that's kind of what life's all about is is enjoying the adventure. All of us are here for something, you know, and yeah. uh, we're creative with our own talents and and uh, creations and, and everything oh, like yeah, that. Man. That's yeah. that's what brings us here, and yeah. it's super exciting. But you touched a lot about a lot of points there. And you're talking about the imagination, which I think is really, really unique. And you're comparing it to some of the, the current events and things like that, like the oil deal and, and things like that. How does that translate when you think of like the music videos? Do you think because when I think about the, the music videos, I thought of it um, if you were there are some positions for artists to be on a level where they do have a say um, and more frequently too now where they can be more the creative side of the music video so they can release their imagination and make the producer know um, um, about that. So what's your take on that? Are you optimistic with it or, or are you pretty set on that it limits the, the capacity of imagination? No, it, it can certainly, as long as it's, uh, you know, interpreted by the, the creator of that, whatever that music is the piece has has a you know it has life there but even though say for instance uh in i'm your captain the song i'm your captain oh yeah i, I got up in the middle of the night and wrote that it, and it was you know you start writing and I didn't want to go back to the top and reread anything. I had to just keep writing the words as they were coming to me. But I had no conception, Brother Nate, of what it meant at all. And so many people have this and they have that. And, and they ask me, well, were you talking about soldiers? Were you talking about a captain on a ship? Were you talking about the mutiny that is happening within the United States and uh, the loss of our freedom, our, our blessed constitution, you know, all these rights that we as the people should have known. Uh, what, you know, what is it all about? And I have to tell them the truth. I have no idea. I just mm -hmm. wrote the words. I am the messenger. So uh, with regard to somebody who has a concept and they want to make the video because this is what their song is saying so they they can govern what is being seen you know by folks on the video without the video you the people will have their own video running and you're just going to mm -hmm. limit it to that whatever that is and i've seen some you know, music videos that were, that provoke you to think. And those kind of videos I can, I can get along with, you know, they, they provoke you to think about things, about what's going on. And it, and it coincides with the lyrics as they're coming across. And that makes sense. But to absolutely define and confirm something uh you know by making a video and this is what it means this is what it is you are going to take that imaginative part away from some people that would have translated it differently mm -hmm. it, no matter what yeah i think that's definitely understood i mean i i've got to admit when you i'm th if if i were to ever imagine i think I'm your captain is an absolute deviation of a composition of something that ever will ever need a video to. And I don't, I don't think that song needs it. It is such 
a beautiful compositional piece of work. And I wanted to ask you about that. You said you have no clue where it came from. You're a guy from the Midwest, from Michigan, right? So how yeah. in the world are you thinking about sailing the seas, being a captain? Where, where's that inspiration coming from? Do you, you, you said you woke up at, in the middle of the night. Like, did you just, were you, do you think you were having a dream or like, it was just like a gut feeling of like a riff or, or the words or the sounds like the boat sounds and the strings. Like, can you tell, can, can we dig into this a little bit? I'm so interested in, yeah, in, man. in that song. Well, it, uh, when I got up, I'm, I'm in that state of mind somewhere between heaven and earth because I didn't allow myself to completely wake up. I didn't, I wanted to stay in that inspirational place. And it is, uh, when you can, when you can control it to yourself to not wake up and don't go and grab a coffee or whatever it is you do to wake up and you just stay in this, you know, there's a place that, uh, God can speak to us. Love can talk to us. And I think love was because before I got up and started writing, when I say my prayers at night, now I lay me down to sleep. I pray the Lord my soul to keep. If I should die before I wake, I pray the Lord my soul to take. These things I ask in Jesus' sake. And then I would bless all my cousins, my aunts, my uncle. I bless everybody. And God bless, God bless, God bless mom. God bless dad. On the, on the end of my prayer that night, I did a little PS and I asked God to give me a song that would reach and touch the hearts of those that the creator wanted to get to. And that's, that was an earnest, honest uh, request to our creator, to the to the entity that put us on this earth. And so I can't help but think that I was given those words and that music to touch the hearts of those that love wants to get to. Because God is love. That's all there is to it. I mean, we run into a lot of other shit here on the planet, but it's not related to love. It's all, all the fear, all of the, oh, it's demonic. Oh, it's, you know, it's beyond the imagination. I want to bring it back into that love and bring it into the confidence uh, that we have as, as a person to know that love is not going to abandon us no matter where we are. And people go, well, look at those poor kids over there in Africa. Look at those kids in India. Love hasn't abandoned them. They're living under uh, conditions that are not the same as what we live under here in the United States. I mean, why do you think all of those people coming across the border want to come in here? We, you know, we put out movies, uh, <laughs> you know, everybody wanted a piece of the United States. All these movies went worldwide, Brother Nate. And so people from different countries came to the United States seeking the freedom that our Constitution offers to the end. And like the, Ameri the American dream deal, right? You know, it's such a blessed yeah, thing to grow up in this country. I see the flag there. It's very patriotic. And, and it's just a very beautiful thing that that's going on and, and that we've been blessed to to be a part of in this country um you know having the freedom to to become an artist and to become a guy that can can create um a musical and just pieces of art for an audience and in in your case it's not necessarily just an audience you you've said before you're a man of the people so we're all people you get to play to humans you get to play the humility in that is just so grounded in, in, a, in a great, um, gracious fashion. So it, it goes to speak to your character. It goes to speak to, you know, what a great guy you are. And, and you're doing that through shredding a guitar. As well. <laughs> it's, it's awesome. And, and through I'm Your Captain, like the compositional piece, it's just not like I haven't heard something like that 
that's that that's been replicated i mean it was segmented into like uh i would say part one and part two kind of thing but it just completely transitions and i can't let alone to to help and ask myself how in the world did this transition yeah it just got written out but by the end you've got strings and you've got the 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 voices and everything is like the boat sounds or what is it a flute maybe like all of it coming together right at the end and it's like you're arriving you the imagination is just struck me and it could that's just me and it could strike many, many other people individually. And um, and for you, like just just what a what a wild piece. And you said you you wrote it in the middle of the night. What, did you imagine the strings coming about and like the ending there too? Or did you have to let it out of your brain over time? I was in Cleveland. I was doing uh, the upbeat show, which was a regional rock and roll show. Um this particular time that we were doing the upbeat show uh james brown was on there that time and uh oh what was that band uh the critters were on (laughs) uh and and i was over with my messenger guitar and i was playing this riff that that i had played with it with that unique C chord inversion in it. And I was uh, talking to David Spiro. His dad, Herman, owned the station. Great people. This is back when Americans, patriotic Americans, owned the radio stations and television stations. This is before the freaking corporations took over. So I'm showing David and the, the band leader, Tommy Baker, he hears this chord that I'm playing and I'm showing David and he comes over and he says, wait a minute, man. He says, what are you playing here? I said, this is a song I just wrote. It's called, I'm your captain. And I start playing the lick and he's, he says, man, you had my wheels turning from, I was over there with the band and I could hear those chords. He says, I had to come over here. He says, dude, when you get to the end of this song, when you get past your middle part where it breaks down into that minor, he says, that's a beautiful thing, man. He says, just keep going through the refrain. I'm getting closer to my home. He says, I hear in my head right now, I can hear strings. I can hear the oboe. I can hear the flute, the French horn. He says, I'm hearing all kinds of stuff. He says, man, just let me have that part of that, that song to expand it. I said, dude, when we when we get in the studio and it, we were going in the studio because uh, that was part of our the plans for that trip, we were going to go in and record that thing like the next day. Right. So I said, OK, we will go on and on and on with it and we'll give you a chance, brother, uh, to say what you need to say it, to, to, you know, because he is such a creative guy. Um, that day, James Brown was rehearsing the song that he was going to do on camera. And one of the horn players uh, blew a clam. And so James Brown fired him. Bam. He says, you're fired. You're out of here because of a bad note. Okay. <laughs> yeah. That, that's what a clam is. I mean, when, <laughs> if, it's a bass note, if it's a bass note a guitar note a keyboard anyone can have a clam right <laughs> this guy just blew it on a, on a trumpet so he looks over at tommy baker james brown says tommy can you play this and tommy came over there and he looked at the chart he said yes sir i could play that and so tommy baker sat in that day with james brown and just off the top of his head, played those parts. And uh, that was a memorable time for me. Just, you know, seeing the creativity just manifest before me. Here I am, this, I was 20 years old, Nate. And it, this is happening in front of me. I'm, uh, I'm loving it, you know, I'm just loving it. So to have Tommy Baker, that kind of quality, that kind of character influence my song 
And I have told people uh, over the years just where that came from. That was not my strings and flutes and orchestration. That was Tommy Baker's. God bless Tommy Baker. I don't know where he's at in the world or if he's still here. He might be in heaven waiting on me. <laughs> I don't know. But uh, that is the that's where it came from. And that's the truth. Oh, my goodness. Did it just fall into place? Just right. time? It just you were there and he, and he had it. And it was just. Yeah, man. One thing led to another just like that to create that art. That's absolutely insane. It, it's such a piece. I mean, that like makes it. It just mended it. Watching that happen before your eyes and playing on your part. And you yeah, just got to watch it come together. I mean, how special is that, right? Inch me. Is... <laughs> wow. Yeah, absolute legendary song. If anybody hasn't heard that song, you got to check it. Because this is back. Um, when when was that song released? You recall? Um, early. 1970. 1970. And for that time, this song, I think in my eyes, it's an absolute revolutionary composition. It's like no other, honestly. Um, you're so let's move to you spoke about radio and radio we're part of Mav Radio and uh, this is under uh, it's a blessing to be a part of Mav Radio and to be able to represent um, this this form of communication still talking form playing music on the radio things like that having radio shows having yeah, guests radio had a ginormous influence on you growing up on releasing music calling radio stations what does radio mean to you and uh, what, what's your take on it now? But we could start with a history lesson, if we'd like, uh, on your story of it. Yeah. Well, I appreciate that. And I appreciate the opportunity to, to speak about it because I've lived through the years. Um, before we had a television, when I was a kid, my Aunt Dorothy, my mom's sister, she had six kids. My mom had six kids. And we all sat in front of a radio, dude, this wooden radio that was shaped, you know, like that. I mean, it was big with a monster speaker in it. And we would listen to Flash Gordon and we'd listen to the Lone Ranger and we would listen to the creaking door and everybody and my my mom and Aunt Dorothy, they would pop popcorn and put it in a great big you know, grocery sack. And that grocery sack would just be soaked with butter by the time we got down, you know, and us kids are like stuffing the popcorn in our mouth and, and our imaginations were going 110 miles an hour, dude, you can imagine there we were. And so the, the radio influenced me early on and, and just sitting there and being, uh, you know, close to your cousins uh your brothers and sisters how you grab each other and go oh my god it's like just from what you're hearing you know uh there was no visual the visual was going on in our imagination and that's why i have such a deep appreciation for what music has done and can, can do but the 777 rule was created by the fcc to limit the ownership uh, to any individuals uh, to 7 a.m., 7 f.m., and 7 television stations. It was the 777 rule. And that prevented the monopoly that we now suffer from. And why they got rid of it, it's all part of what's going on right now the mind control, the dumbing down, the, the stagnation of our imaginative process. And uh, when it was the 777, like I said, in Cleveland, we would go to Channel 5, you know, to Herman Spiro's uh, television station. And then after we would uh, go in and play our music, we go over to Herman's house and play football with David and Bear and all the people, you know, the kids from the block. And then we, we would do things that he, David had this wind up eight millimeter camera oh, and, yeah. we would, and we would, uh, <laughs> yeah. And there was, and he had a barber chair and they'd put us in the barber chair and he had this fake blood 
and we put this shaving oh foam all over us and and then start shaving us and then all of a sudden the next frame's got all this fake blood in here oh my oh, goodness no. you got my <laughs> <laughs> and this that's the kind of uh you know imaginative things that came from listening to the radio and 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 from the individual ownership of uh you know the radio stations by american families patriotic people with a patriotic sense yeah. and a conscience over what a moral conscience over what our children saw and heard that conscience disappeared in 1996 under the Clintonistas. Uh, that's when it was deregulated and uh, Clinton signed that and it, it like started that razor across the throat right. of America. And as the corporations bought more and more stations, uh, just to give you an example, Nate, my friend up here owned several stations, uh, some AMs and FMs. I think he had like nine stations. And I said, Dale, why did you sell your property, man? When you owned that property, it was rocking, man. And, and the DJs that you had on there, they kept our community together. We had community. And now this, this corporate conglomerate BS is destroying our community because they limit what we listen to, to their playlist. There's a guy in New York City okay. who's programming for 4,500 stations across the nation. Mm -hmm. It's his pick of songs. It's no longer mm -hmm. the influence of the people on their local station. In 1975, I received an award, a BMI award, because my song, Bad Time to Be in Love, was played more than any other song that year. Wow. It did, but it didn't go to number one. And I'll tell you, uh, it, but it got played more than the one that did go to number one. And now let me explain why. People were calling in. You could call the station and talk to the DJ. Hey, can you play blah, blah, blah? Yeah, man, I'll do that for you. It's going to be number three coming up or whatever, you know. And, and sometimes they would take the calls and record them and play them back over the air so that the audience could hear and they were inspired to, to then call the station and make their own mm -hmm. record. So in 1975, people were calling and requesting bad time, play bad time. And I've heard this from so many jocks, ex-jocks. <laughs> uh, man, they were calling in. They wanted to hear this. I, I just get done playing it and it'd be 10 more people wanted to hear it again, you know? Um, so, so that was part of what influenced the, the airwaves and uh, you know, the song it stood on its own. Uh, Jimmy Einer was the producer of that song. And he also produced some kind of wonderful, which was on the same album in 1975. And that was a big hit for us, but legendary. Yeah. <laughs> and John Ellison, uh, who wrote the song is a personal friend of mine now. And uh, he's my bone soup brother. And we uh, talk on the phone. We, uh, I presented to him at the West Virginia Music Hall of Fame. I presented his award to him on stage and I got to sing with him that night. Uh, and I, he gave me the second verse. He says, you take the second verse. And, uh, and let's just do this song. And I jammed with them. I had my axe. I jammed with them on some music. We had fun with it. Um, and we reminisced of the days that I'm talking about with you right now, brother, when it was more free, when people had a say in what was coming off that speaker. They mm -hmm. requested it. It was part of, you know, the, our community. But since the corporate takeover of the radio stations, now there are still some privately owned 
Uh, I don't know if MAV Radio is privately owned or if they are owned by a conglomerate. Uh, do you know? Well, so we, we have a structure in place where it's student ran. So we have the authority to be able to, I mean, of course there's regulations with the FCC, so we're not throwing curse words left and right and everything. And there's regulations to it, which is, which is fine. You know, I think that's, that's good to an extent, but we do have the freedom to have radio shows, to have student led um, freedom to do what we'd like with the radio. You know, we broadcast sports, things like that, but having like radio shows and uploading songs and things like that, having the freedom of it is really, really nice. And that's part of the blessing of being a student led um, university radio station. Um, right. What you're talking about is super interesting because it's almost like in the nineties, that's when the birth of the conglomerates is sounding like, right? With radio and the seven, yeah. seven, seven rule getting um, um, chopped in, in a sense and deregulated. And yeah. what I think was missed there is the structure that was in place. I don't know if it was an, uh, a necessarily conscious structure that was created for this exact um, reasoning to be able to create communities, to be able to create experiences and messages through the radio that leak, trickled all the way down to the individual like you, that influenced you. Um, I'm not sure if that entire structure that was created with time was necessarily um, um, honed in on when they when they deregulated it. I'm not sure if, if the ones that even had the 7-7 rule had that in place, but the 7-7 rule in your eyes was just perfect in a sense that it was more interactive you know people owned it it trickled down the entire system to the point where again back in 1975 that's where main you're hearing most of your music you know you're not picking up your cell phone and saying hey siri play this tune for me you know you're getting right. most of your tunes and hearing new music on the radio it's totally yeah. interactive exactly. so like I'm not sure what that, that's just very interesting with the structure and how it's destructured. Now we're seeing the result happen over, you know, 20 plus years. Radio is a totally different world than it was, but the fact that it had such an influence on you um, and, and you've had your own songs play on the radio many, many times. What was that? Like how big, how much of an impact it was, is huge with you. Yeah. And uh... Let me share with you a moment uh, when it was the 777 rule. It was still in place, of course. Uh, the band that I was in just prior to Grand Funk Railroad was called The Pack. And The Pack, the fabulous pack, <laughs> <laughs> The Pack had gone to uh, Nashville. We drove down to Nashville. And we recorded a song called the Harlem, Harlem Shuffle. And uh, it was one of the songs that was played on the radio in Flint, Michigan, uh, and that, that we really enjoyed <clears throat> and so much that we wanted to create our own version of it. So we went to Nashville and re we recorded in this guy's garage. And uh, on the way back, what we did, we had an acetate, which is, uh, it's like a sample record. They cut this in this virgin vinyl, but it's got a piece of metal under it with the vinyl on the top. It was called an acetate and it looked like a 45 record, you know, with a big hole. So we are driving as fast as we can get away with <laughs> coming north because we wanted to get this record into Bob Dell's hands. We knew Bob Dell, who was a DJ on WTAC in Flint, Michigan. We knew if we could get there before he went off the air, there was the chance that he might play this record on the radio and we would hear it over the radio. I, I mean, this was the first time, dude. This was- That would have been- yeah, that would have been the first time you'd have a song on the radio. And yeah, so man. you guys were driving there. OK. Yeah, it's like 1968. And we are driving fast. We're doing 120 miles an hour sometimes. Seriously, we want to oh get this. And we were listening to WTAC from the state line when we crossed over from Ohio into Michigan. Uh, we could pick it up just 
you know, scratchy, but we picked it up. We dialed into him and we're going, come on, come on, come on. We pull in the parking lot. We run into WTAC and we said, Bob, we just recorded this down in Nashville. Can you spin it? He says, give me that thing. And he put it on and he played it right then, brother. And you want to talk about some happy guys, man. <laughs> uh, we were just floating around inside the rail, the, the radio station, about three feet off the ground. <laughs> just, just, <laughs> oh my God, we got our record on the radio. It was, you know, that was a big deal. Mm. Well, as we are leaving the station, Bob Dell, God bless him. He said, you boys, you see all those albums over there? Pick through them and anything you want, take home with you because whatever you don't take is going to go in the dumpster. Right. And these are just albums that people, record companies, send to them uh, to have them play, you know, or have them listen to to see if there's a song on there that they can play on the radio. That's back when the DJs had a say in what was going to be. What was, what was going to be played because they just had to throw it on and you in turn brought it to him in person <laughs> which is amazing well let me tell you that when on the way out the door the other guys were going through the albums and i just kind of went over and i did uh, record roulette and i went and i stopped that one and i picked it out and i only took one album and it was howard tate get it while you can that's the name of the the album it was a purple base, you know, 33 and a third album cover, kind of like a foil below, uh, beneath this, this purple base that had some blue where Howard's face shined through. It was just a very unique album cover. And when I got that home and I peeled the, the plastic off of it, the cellophane, and put that on the record player, man, this guy, Howard Tate, has influenced more people in the music business. Uh, he influenced Aretha Franklin. He, he influenced Donny Hathaway, Stevie Wonder. Yeah, he influenced Janis Joplin. Uh, he's a major influence. And uh, when I dropped that needle in the groove, I immediately honed into his vocals and I went, oh man, I want to sing like this guy sings. He, he is incredible. And so part of my vocal style, I got from listening to Howard Tate that night when I got home and put that record on brother, uh, my voice, my vocal uh, style changed. He was birthed uh, from a radio station. <laughs> right, on. right on, dude. That's so special. And and so that's 1968 when you drove 120 miles an hour to get your song on the radio. And then how long from 1968? And then in 1970, you're writing, I am your captain. Uh, right. And then, and so from, from 1968, when was it until um, heartbreak, when was it until you started, it was normalized that you were just having radio plays and getting phone calls saying, Hey, this is, this is coming in all the time. Like what was that shift? How long was it? And, and did it, did you become normal? I know you loved hearing the name you were born to be a rock star, you know um, what was uh, the shift like and how long was it? Well, in 1969, Nate, we played uh, grand funk played the, Atlanta International mm -hmm. Pop. It was 185,000 people there. And they were from all over the United States. We did not have a record deal. We did have original music. And so we played Heartbreaker in that set. We played Are You Ready? We played all the songs that were on our first album, On Time. And, uh, and the people loved it. In fact, we, we played for free because the attorneys that were doing the legal work for this festival were out of New York City, and they were the same attorneys that our manager, Terry Knight, 
was using to do to do the grand funk thing with. So they got us on the bill uh, and we played for free. We opened the show at noon on the first day. The second day we went on at 7 p.m. And the third day, the last day of the festival, we were on at 11 o'clock at night, full lights, spotlights, everything. It went, uh, and the people, they, they loved us. They absolutely loved us. And that's how we got started, really. If it wasn't for those festivals, uh, we wouldn't have had the popularity that we did have. We wouldn't have been playing stadiums, you know, selling out Shea Stadium faster than the Beatles in 1971. Uh, but the, we played Texas International Pop. That was uh, in Louisville, Texas. And we played uh, Strawberry Fields. And we played festival in Cleveland at, the, at a stadium where the audience was up in, in the seats. And soon as we started into inside looking out, the audience came to the stage. <laughs> they right. came across that field, buddy. And the cops just kind of stood us. To, they, they said, well, oh, here they come. They're not going to try to stop thousands of people coming to the stage. They just had to stand aside. It'd be and quite hard to as well. I mean, you might you may be outnumbered pretty easily there. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so respectively. It was a peaceful thing. And I remember seeing a clip. I think it was CBS News. Uh, they were saying, look, because they were showing footage of the people coming to the stage. They said, look, this is some kind of a cult. <laughs> it was a cult to, to, the, to the guy, this announcer, because he was this older guy. And here's these younger kids. Oh, it's got to be a cult. This must be what they're talking about when they say that C-U-L-T word. You know, it's like, oh, my God. It was some absolutely adoring, rabid music fans coming to get closer to us and to rock with us because we incite the love within people. I have... Uh, intention in my heart to reach out with that love that I've been given and the, the love that we are all created from. Uh, and it works because people get involved. Uh, as you can see, Brother Nate, as you were talking about from Chile with love, the, the DVD shows the interaction mm -hmm. with the audience and how enthusiastic people get. And it's just from the purpose of that music. It's to rev us up, to get our blood flowing together, to get our minds flowing together, to get our love flowing together, man. It's an undescribable experience that, that a concert can have on a human being. I mean, you're there and, and some introverted people that don't, that like their bubble space, they might even go to these concerts where they're touched skin to skin with people all across in a, in a sea of humans for an experience you know you have yeah. from Chile with love for example you guys have lights going on that's a factor you have the humans in there that create you know this sort of experience but it would just be a, a sea of people in a crowd like uh it wouldn't be complete without the music in the performance that is amazing that brings it all together but it's only a factor as well it's that like you're talking about how you did acoustic shows over the, the, the summer, you know, it's like the, the intimate experience or the rocker experience. And there's all these factors that go into it. And yeah. what was the first, or what was over time you've, you've sold out Shea stadium. You did your first show in front of a sea of people at the Atlanta pop festival um, in 1969. What was your favorite um, a performance to do and where was it? Did you like, uh, was your favorite spot maybe in Florida by the palm trees? Was it somewhere in the Midwest? What was, or maybe overseas in Chile? Over time, what has uh, your favorite place been and, and why? Atlanta, Georgia, 1969, 4th of July, man, the international pop. That was the first gig we ever did as Grand Funk. You know, actually we played the Hamburg County Fair up by Buffalo, New York. 
And we played that like a week prior to going to Atlanta, Georgia to play the pop festival. So it, it was actually our second gig, but no record deal. Nobody knew who Grand Funk Railroad was. That was just, people mm -hmm. would say, the guy couldn't even say Grand Funk Railroad. I don't <laughs> know if he, he did it on purpose or <laughs> he was just too screwed up. Maybe there was too much- Who are these nobodies, you know? Running through his veins, I don't know. But <laughs> he would say Grand Frank Railroad or, or, you know, he Railway or, he never said it right. Then the three times that he introduced the band, uh, but the people got it. The people got it. Right. The word went out. And so, oh, well, they saw it too. They yeah. saw you sh absolutely shredding, ripping your shirt off for the crowd saying, that one works. You know, that yeah. that was probably your most uh, favorite experience there was that second. I mean, that had to just been completely captivating, not just for you. You were totally in the moment, I'm sure, but captivating for the audience saying, who in the world are these guys playing this? Like thing, I've never heard this before. You're shredding it there as a young guy in your 20s. So that was your first uh, or your favorite, one of your favorite experiences and places to play at? Yeah, it's the most memorable. And, and Shea Stadium was great too. I mean, because the New York audiences, I love the New York audience. I mean, uh, that city has got some great people in it. Uh, back then, the people camped out on the lawn of Shea Stadium to get tickets. This is before there was any electronic tickets, dude. There was, you had to buy the ticket from the ticket office at the stadium. That's the only way tickets were available. So they camped out, you know, thousands, thousands camped out mm -hmm. to get those tickets. And, you know, we played the show and that, with humble pie opening the, the show and that if you've ever seen any of the footage from that on uh, on youtube uh, the the thing was bouncing man. <laughs> physically bouncing <laughs> oh and uh, the fire marshals almost stopped the show because they they didn't know if that structure could stand the strain <laughs> seriously <laughs> um but that uh Atlanta Pop Festival will always be my number one pick for, you know, the best gig I've ever played. That's the most memorable gig right there. Uh, getting there, you know, the guy who loaned us his van had a Chevy mm -hmm. window van. He loaned us his driver, Jimmy. And Jimmy was driving us because we had played a gig and we were too tired to stay up all night uh, to drive to Atlanta, Georgia. So Jeep Holland lent us his van and his driver. And we put a U-Haul trailer on the back of that van with all of our equipment in it. And this was before I-75 was complete. And we were headed southbound and we were off on the side roads and I was riding shotgun. I was, you know, I had my head up against the window and vibrating off the, the road, but I'm gone, man. I'm, I'm like sleeping and, and I woke up and as I woke up, it's, it's not quite daylight yet. It's, it's, you know, that the, the twinkling of dawn is, is there, and, but everybody still had the headlights on and I look up, and I see this sign that says I-75 and the arrows to the right. And I said, Jimmy, I-75 goes to the right here. And it's like he was going so fast, dude. He he just turned. You know, I think he was in a daze, you know, from driving all night. And he turned and the U-Haul trailer flipped and it went down through the ditch, rolling down through the ditch, snapped the safety chains off that uh, trailer. And we had to unload the U-Haul, take all of our equipment out of it, and then push it back up on the, the tires, on the wheels. And then and he backed the van down to it. We rehooked it and pulled it up and put all the equipment back in it. And we're going down the edge of the expressway and a little bit faster, a little bit faster. All of a sudden this 
this wheel passes us on the left side. I went, and I turned around, sparks are flying like crazy. I said, dude, that was the tire off the trailer. <laughs> and, and I mean, he goes, oh my God. And he pulls over this. We had to go and retrieve this tire. Uh, the wheel had bounced over into the southbound lane of I-75 and, and it almost hit this uh, semi truck that was southbound. And the semi truck, you could see the smoke coming off of his tires as he saw the thing coming and it just flew across his hood in front of his windshield and off into this field. We go over there, retrieve the wheel, come back. We take two lug nuts off the other side of the trailer and put this wheel back on and it's held on by two lug nuts. And it's, you know, like one of these uh, going down the road. Right. The yeah. next, luckily for us, the next exit was a U-Haul trailer place there, a, a gas station with U-Haul trailers. We traded out the trailer and we beat feet for Atlanta, but there was heavy damage done to the amplifiers. And when we got to Atlanta, some of the chassis, because they were aluminum chassis and they had these heavy transformers, the transformers ripped right off the chassis, severed the wires, cracked the circuit boards. Uh, some of the traces were just, just cracked, gone. Mm -hmm. And so when we got to Atlanta, we're, we're looking at this stuff going, oh my God, man, it's never going to happen. Well, this is roadies from all these different bands came over and they went, dude, man, we got a soldering iron with, with, we can help you guys. And so all these roadies, I mean, there must've been a dozen other helpers, people that came together and put our stuff together. They soldered the wires back together. They, you know, they set the transformer on top of the amp cabinet because there was no, I mean, there was no, uh, the, where it was sitting, there's a big hole. <laughs> there was no place for it on the chassis anymore. So they put all this stuff together and made it work. And that was part of our community back then. Rock and roll, we, it was like, we would do anything to, to help that next band get their mm -hmm. stuff on. Because we wanted to hear them too. And we wanted the, the audience to be rocking. And, uh, you know, that's part of the equation. When you say, what is your favorite uh, gig that you've done? That was part of what made it my favorite too. Not just the fact that there was 185,000 people screaming their brains mm -hmm. out for us. But to <laughs> Which get, is a great factor, I'm sure. Yes. But <laughs> to, to get there, the, the whole, uh, you know, the unfolding of this gig, man, you know, with that, u-haul trailer and that whole episode mm -hmm. uh, and then people right there at the last teaming together come over you know they came over from 10 wheel drive and from janice joplin's band and from uh, everybody that was there you know their roadies helped us and they didn't even know who the hell we were dude it's like right. they helped us because we were community and the radios back then, brother Nate, the radio stations held the community together because the DJs had the free reign to do, to play what they wanted to play. They could take phone calls from people and play what the people wanted to hear. And that is the biggest difference between radio then and radio now. It, the, the, the community has been busted up. We're still out here, but we're not together like we were. But thank mm -hmm. God for MAV Radio that you have the, the free reins to speak and people will hear because this is going out on the airwaves. Uh, this is some love going out. This is the truth. And, uh, and people can lock their teeth into this and appreciate it. And I appreciate you, uh, your questions, uh, because, uh, you know, you're a young guy. Uh, you are appreciative of your position at the radio station and you're bringing something of value to the listeners. God bless the listeners, man. Absolutely. And it's like the community that we can try to build uh, together, you know, with 
you know, it's different. There's, it's the university, they're younger guys that the music and mainstream has shifted and changed. So what I like to do is try to sneak in different tunes from examples of mid seventies and eighties, kind of share what the gold mines have been that yeah. the precursor to what has been created now, yes. you know, like, uh, the, the genres are completely different now. They've evolutionized, they've changed, they've shifted. But the entire catalog of music has that our parents listened to, that our grandparents listened to, is still dug away. And by the way, now we have these little sucker tools to use to find those things all at the touch of a button. So we have the tools. We don't have to go to thrift stores and dig up for the vinyls unless you want to. Yeah. You can actually find all the gold that has been created ever before on these digital devices which is an absolute blessing and we can share those messages with people and be like hey by the way like you like this music you know that they were doing this back in the 70s and yeah. they had to actually back in the 60s they couldn't just press c and chop the clip they had to actually cut the clip and trim it together on tape yeah. they had to bring it together and that's what that's what led us to where we are now it's like that appreciation for what's been done before the composition that you've made with i'm your sailor is like such a revolutionary piece of music you see like stories and music now and it's like that's a beautiful tune but it's like guys were doing that back in the 70s too by the way so yeah. it's really cool to be able to share uh, you know different tunes and different stories and things like that with the community and build a community with things like Mav Radio and having outlets like that and having great people like you to join us and talk about different things. And it's just, it's great. It's amazing. And it's a great uh, to see and reflect on the messages that have been created in the artwork that's out there. Awesome. Yeah, man. And, and as you mentioned, uh, the availability that you can just uh, look it up and find it on your little box there on your little phone uh, and bring it to you that 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 is definitely an advantage uh, to be to not have to spend the time but I do like those thrift store uh, record deals I mean you oh, know absolutely you know you go you can find there, oh some there's some that are pristine that looks like the, re the record has never been played. And you look, you lay your hands on that and you go, oh my God, that's mine. <laughs> yeah. It's like the diamond in the dust, you know? Yeah, it's dude. literally just a little, in. The, it's the corner of the thrift store and it's packaged and nobody knows about it. It's yeah. like the little piece of diamond that you found in the gold mine, you yeah. know? That's so it, cool. Um, and, you know, you do have to search and look around on these these Internet platforms for the good music. They're not going to advertise necessarily songs that are, you know, um, back from the 70s, 60s, even 50s, maybe, you know, until Christmas time comes around and we hear more Frank Sinatra coming around. But, <laughs> you know, um, um, you do have to dig a little bit and, and seek and, and be open to to being like, yeah. hey, what came before us? And, and you're an absolute precursor to that. Um, yeah. Well, thank you. I appreciate it. Yeah good being back with you today absolutely and same to you as we close out you know i i just want to bring up and and uh thank you for for the chili of love dvd that you did I'm, i hope it's doing well it's an amazing dvd by the way and you could give the 800 number if you'd like because every three dollars is going towards it i i i've heard and i hope uh, we thank you for the the support that you have for veterans and veterans day passed not too long ago and you're a man of the people so if there's something you'd like to say for them and tell us just fill us in how it is going um that can close us out so we thank you yeah man well we've been able to uh give thousands of dollars to the veterans support foundation thanks to the good people who have bought the dvd uh out of the 14 dollars and 99 cents that they pay for it three dollars from each dvd goes to veterans support foundation and veterans support foundation are a, a group of guys and gals that are veterans themselves they don't take any money dude they don't take a cent from any of the contributions it all goes for uh, uh getting the veterans off the streets into uh, temporary housing, uh, getting them jobs, getting them job training, 
uh, helping them out a real, it, it's a real foundation by real people. And some of our veterans, when they return to the United States from wherever they've been in this world, uh, they need help. They need someone who is qualified to advocate for them uh, in front of the Department of Veterans Affairs. And so Veterans Support Foundation is there. And I uh, encourage people, if they know somebody or, or know of a vet that needs help, uh, they can call 800-882-1316. That's 800-882-1316, Veterans Support Foundation. Right on. Well, Mark Farner, again, you wrote 92% of the Grand Funk Railroad catalog, the absolute you. legend, the patriotic Thank legend, as I like to say. You Thank got you. the American flags going on. You got the beautiful <laughs> lights in the background with the guitar. It's just the American spirit, man. Thank yeah. you so much for joining us and coming back for another conversation with Mark Farner. It's great to be with you. And uh, we'll hopefully have you again sometime. So thank you for your yeah, time. Man. Thank and you. Thanks for coming on. I appreciate it, brother. And thanks to all the Mav Radio fans. God bless y'all. Have a happy holidays. Merry Christmas. And uh, if I don't see you in the future, I'll see you in the pasture. All right. Thank you, Mark. All right, brother. <laughs>